Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. The title of the message is The Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And I'm going to be reading from chapter 1, I'm sorry, through verse 1 of chapter 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. 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 Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen. A lot of hallelujahs in heaven. You better, learn, you better learn to say hallelujah. A lot of hallelujahs in heaven. <laughs> and then the voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! <laughs> For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen of the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see what you do, uh, see, uh, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, open up our hearts and our minds to your word, Lord God. For we know, Lord God, and we confess to you, without the illumination of the spirit, Lord God, this makes no sense to us. But with the illumination of the Spirit, the Word of God becomes alive and living. And Lord, when we open our hearts to it, it can produce a harvest of 30, 60, 100 times what is sown. And we pray this today. Let this be a harvest day, Lord God, in your Word, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to look at two things this morning in Revelation chapter 19, 1 through 10. First, we're going to look at triumphal heavenly worship, and then we're going to look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But just for a moment, look at verse 10. In verse 10, here's, here's an interesting verse. John, the apostle, the one who laid his head upon the bosom of the Lord at the Last Supper, the one who says in the Gospel of John, seven times, I am the one that Jesus loved, and he had wonderful standing with Jesus, that John begins to worship this angel. And notice what the angel says to him in, uh, in verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. And understand what the angel is saying here. The angel understands. He comes from a, from a lineage of beings where the greatest of that lineage desired to be worshipped by the other angels and ultimately desired to overthrow God and to sit upon the throne of God. So here is an angel who has a clear understanding of the trouble Satan got himself into and he is appalled at the idea of, of John falling down and worshiping him and he rebukes him and says, get up. I just want to stress this. We are not to worship anyone or anything, any dead person, any dead saint, or any dead other thing in this world. We are to worship the living God and Him alone. Also, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 25 and 26, there is a scene where Peter goes to meet with a centurion, a great Roman soldier, and the centurion falls down at Peter's feet, and Peter there says to him, Stand up, I am a man just like you. We are not to worship people. We, we are not to worship nature. 
We are not to worship the creation. You are not to worship your car or your house or your job or money or anything else. We are to worship the living God. And the scripture makes a very strong statement there. When we come to the book of the Revelation, as we have been looking at in these last weeks, you see that, that worship is, is a major part of heaven. I say this to you. Catch the spirit of worship because the spirit of, of worship is more caught than taught. You, know, you really can't teach it. There are some things I find that are very easy to teach that people get. I, 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 look, some of you, you come here, you don't have a clue what worship is. And some of you, you're, you're, you're experiencing the wonder of worship in your life. But it's, it's, you have to catch the Spirit. The Spirit has to blow through your life. And Now, what I want to look at first is, uh, again, what are some reasons to worship the Lord? And there are five here. There are thousands in the Scriptures. You can turn to, to Psalms. On every verse, you can find a reason to worship the Lord. Psalms is, is the worship book of the Bible. I read a Psalm or five or six of them every day. And I've been doing that for over 20 years. That's where I learned to worship the Lord, in, in, the, in the Psalms. The first thing I do is, is read a Psalm in the morning. And then I go on and I start studying the Word of God and start praying. The first, the first reason for worship, in verses 1 and then verses 7 through 10, I'm just going to focus here on verse 1, fellowship with His people. And if you, if you look here at verse 1, after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. <laughs> Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Notice that word, hallelujah. What does it mean? It means, it means praise the Lord, praise Yahweh in Hebrew, or praise Jehovah in the Greek. And does anybody know where it, it first occurs in the Bible? Anybody? If you're a student of the scriptures, it's an interesting place because it tells us a whole a lot about really what, what the word means. I put, I put it in your notes in 1 Chronicles 16.4. The Ark of the Covenant... Now, understand, if you're, if you're new to the Word of God, the Ark of the Covenant, we're not talking about Noah's Ark. I get a, get a kick. A guy came up to me once, and I was teaching about the Ark of the Covenant, and the Jews carried the Ark of the Covenant all over the desert, and a guy came up to me and he said, do you want me to believe that they were carrying that huge boat all around the desert? No, it's not, it's not Noah's Ark. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It is where the Ten Commandments were, were, were kept. And there was a, a jar of manna, and there was the staff of Aaron, and then there were two beautiful cherubim made of solid gold whose wings would touch, and, uh, and you had uh, the mercy seat. Now, it was the Ark of the Covenant, okay, that was taken by the Philistines. And then God brought a bunch of plagues on the Philistines, and the Philistines said, we need to get rid of this thing. So they returned it to the Lord. And when they returned it, when they returned it to, to David, this is what David did, and again, this is in 1 Chronicles 16.4, and he appointed certain uh, Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and, and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And if you look at the words there, praise the Lord, that is alleluia. He appointed them to alleluia, the God of Israel, to, to praise the God of Israel. Why? Because the presence of God, the Jewish people, they associated the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God. And when the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, was, was in the hands of the Philistines, they said, God has departed Israel. Now it has been returned. And it is, it is connected always with the presence of God. They are, praising, they are praising the Lord. They are saying, Alleluia, because they're in the presence of the Lord. Whenever, whenever we enter into the presence of the Lord, and you get yourself into the presence of the Lord, you, you, you develop a sensitivity, an awareness of the presence of the Lord, you will find that your heart will sing to the Lord and praise the Lord, hallelujah. You, you, if, you're not, if you're not used or you're acclimated to being in the presence of the Lord, hallelujah will, will be something foreign to you. But when you come into the presence of the Lord, there, there is always this, this great... You'll understand this about David. David understood the wonder and the awe and the power of being in the presence of the Lord. For it was when he was in the presence of the Lord that he slayed giants. In the presence of the Lord, he was the great champion and general of the armies of God. 
In the presence of the Lord, he is the greatest songwriter who ever lived. I don't know, you realize the, the achievements of David. He was a man after God's own heart. He understood the, the importance of getting in the presence of the Lord. He was the greatest songwriter who ever lived. He wrote the greatest song in the history of the world, and it's not Stairway to Heaven, nor My Way by Frank Sinatra, actually written by Paul Anka. What is the greatest song that's ever been written that's sung? It's sung throughout the world today in Psalm 23. He was the richest man in the world of his time. The most successful man in the world of his time. He understood the power that comes when you're in the presence of God. You got issues? You got problems? Pastor, you don't know the problems I have. Listen, look, we understand, right? I got problems, right? You got problems, right? Oh, God's children got problems, right? A little therapy for you here this morning? When you get yourself in the presence of God, you know what happens? Your problems start to shrink. Because God is so much bigger than your, your little problems. So you've got problems, you've got financial problems, you've got physical problems, you've got relational problems, you've got problems with your career, you need a job, you need money, you need this, you need that, you've got problems in your marriage, you've got problems in your affairs. Well, just when you get yourself in the presence of God, you know, it's, it's the mistake we make. We, we're, trying, we're trying to get God to solve our problems when God is trying to get us to get into His presence. God's trying to get us right with Him and we're trying to solve our problems. How many of you find you, you keep praying for things that you don't get? You just keep praying and praying. And maybe you want something to change in your life. You know what God wants to change in your life? You. And when you start changing, then things start to change in your life. And so when we get ourselves into the presence of God where these things happen. Now, I just want to show you the, the deep power. The Ark of the Covenant, again, is always associated with the presence of God. And the Ark was kept in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Here's a, here's a beautiful verse. In, first, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 14, again, I put it in your notes. And the Word became flesh. Who's the Word? Jesus. Okay, this is talking about His incarnation. He took on human flesh. Okay. And it says, And the Word became flesh, and notice, And dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice the word dwelt, because the word there is tabernacled. The Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Jesus was the fulfillment of the tabernacle. Jesus is the Ark of the Covenant. And, and when Jesus walked the earth, there, there, you know, there he was. There, there was the presence of God. For he who has seen me has seen the Father. For I and the Father are one. Called himself the great I Am. Now Jesus says to the disciples, listen, I'm going to go away. And it's better that I go away than I stay. Imagine that. You're, you're one of the disciples standing there and he says, it's better that I go. I mean, you're grabbing onto him. You're like, you're like Mary Magdalene clinging onto him. I don't want to let you go, Lord. He's saying, it's better that I go than I stay. Why? Because if I go, I will pour my spirit into you. And not only will you like, see me on the outside, you will have me on the inside. Where's the tabernacle now? We are the tabernacles. We are, we are the temples that, that hold the Ark of the Covenant, the spiritual Ark of the Covenant, which is Jesus. We are the, the dwelling place of God. Understand this. You could grab the depth of this. In Jesus' teaching in John chapter 14 through 16, he taught this at the Last Supper. Most people think at the Last Supper they just, you know, he broke the bread and, you know, and then he, you know, they, they think that was you know, essentially what happened. Judas, you know, started the betrayal. He taught everything that you'll find in John chapter 13 through 17 at the Last Supper. But at the Last Supper, he, basically, he, said to, he said to them, he speaks to us, that the Father will be in you, and the Son will be in you, and the Spirit will be in you. That we become the dwelling place of God. I'll tell you, you walk in with the Lord, and you'll even find, even when you're not walking really well with Him, how many times a day, how many times a week, how many times a month, does there suddenly the awareness that He's in you? Now, I tell you that from experience. I mean, it's great when I'm walking with the Lord, and, and you know, this has been a, a nice time for me, walking, walking really closely with the Lord, and there's that awareness. But how about those times when you're not walking really closely with Him, and all of a sudden you realize He's in you? How, how wonderful is that? The, the very presence of God in us. 
So, so this, this is a, a reason for hallelujah. This is a reason why, why there is praise because they are in the presence of the living God. And you know, it's beautiful in heaven. He's in them. He's with them. He's around them. He, I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. And they can't do anything but, but praise. Hallelujah. Now let's look at the second. The second reason for praise. He delivers his people from their enemies. Verses 1 and 2. Just look at the word, the word here, salvation, in verse 1. He, he, he saves us. He, he delivers us. You stop for a second and think, what has God delivered you from? You know, he, he's delivered us from death. He's delivered us from hell. He's delivered us from sin. He's delivered us from judgment. He's delivered us from Satan. He's delivered us from the world. He's delivered us from our enemies. He's delivered us from poverty. He's delivered us from sickness. He's delivered us from fear. And He's delivered us from a whole lot of things that we're not even aware He's delivered us from. I, I, I use a picture here of the Israelites being delivered from the Egyptians. And, and God here, you know, through the, through the passing of the Red Sea, He delivered them from Pharaoh, He delivered them from Egypt, and He delivered them from slavery. You know what that's a picture of in our lives? Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And Egypt is a type of the world. The world, you know, in all of its, you know the world in all of its uh, garbage... You know, all of its fears and, and angers and prejudices and, and bigotry and all of its slime and all of its snot and all of its slop. The gossip and the slander and all the crap you have to deal with in the world, right? In your jobs and, and, and in the people. You know, all the crap you have to deal with, the pettiness, the smallness. The, you know, it's nice when we gather together. You know, there's no question. When we gather together, there's something different about us. And when, you, when you're out there, that's the world, he delivered us from the world. And He delivered us from slavery. He delivered us from sin. But you're just like they're praising Him because He delivered them from their enemies. And ultimately from this, hey, hey the false religious system, the whore, the, the, the harlot of Revelation. We looked at it, Revelation 17 and 18, the last few weeks. He delivered them from the harlot, this false religious system that ultimately persecutes and, and murders the saints. A third thing of praise here is His justice. They, they praise Him because He is just. And you know, the Word of God, the Lord speaks to us, vengeance is mine. That means it's God's, not ours. It says, vengeance is mine, it's mine to repay. Jesus says, speaks of us, love your enemies. You know, bless those who persecute you. It, it's, it, as hard as it is for some of us, and I'll tell you something, this ain't easy for me. You hit me, I want to hit you back. You know, I'm I'll tell you that, I don't want to hit you back ten times harder than you hit me. That's my desire. I mean, just I'm telling you, what, honestly, that's in my nature. And, and God says, no. He, you know, he doesn't say you need to be a dogmat. He's not saying you can't protect yourself. But it's just, we're not to take vengeance in our own hands. He takes vengeance. He's the only one who has the right to take vengeance and judge. You know why? Because he knows all the facts and we don't. He, he knows the beginning from the end and everything in between. And only He has the right to judge. He knows people's hearts and He is the only one who can truly work out justice. And understand this. Sometimes you get a little depressed. And Tony, you said this the other day to me. We were talking. You said, sometimes I get discouraged when I look at the world. Sometimes you get discouraged being in the world. And you know, you just see, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cruelty. There's, there's just a, a lot of unbelief. There's a, it, it, the world system stinks. And I uh, just want to say this, God is going to judge all things. Every per Nobody's getting away with anything. God, God is going to judge. When you see, when you see that person who's, who's really evil and you say, geez, you know what, have they gotten away with it? Look at how prosperous they are. Understand, they're not getting away with anything. Somebody has to pay the price. And if they refuse to allow Jesus to pay the price, because that is one place where you will find justice is the cross. There, there is justice. How can God forgive us? That was a big question I asked myself when you know, I was an atheist and I was, I was kind of looking at, at Christianity and I'm, I'm looking and I'm saying, well, you know, how can God just forgive people? You know, I mean, you just, in this world, you just can't forgive people. If somebody, if somebody commits a crime, man, they need, to, they need to pay the price. You know, you, you, you want to dance, you've got to pay the, uh, the band. You want to commit the crime, you know, you've got to pay the man. I mean, just, how could God just say, oh, you know what, you're forgiven? I mean, I just, I'm looking at the Christians, you know, they, they come up to me and they witness to me and they say, well, you could just be forgiven by believing. And I started to understand. He paid the price. 
God became a man and he went to that cross 2,000 years ago, six hours one Friday, and he hung there for six hours, taking all the sins of the world upon himself. And understand, we look at it and we say, oh, you know what, he suffered physically. Folks, the physical suffering cannot compare to what was going on spiritually with Jesus Christ on the cross. Because, look, it seems like as though when the darkness came over him, it's like the Father turned away. And the scripture even says he became sin. And somehow... He was able to, as God, to take all of our eternity of hell upon himself, those six hours, one Friday, and suffer and die. And he paid the price. And, and, you, and that's the justice of God. And you can have God pay the price on the cross, or you can try to pay it yourself. Good luck. Good luck. The uh, fourth year is permanent crushing of the rebellion. Verse 3. It's his permanent crushing here, uh, and, and it says here, it talks about this, this harlot, this false system, Babylon. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. It, it's God, God's permanence in crushing the rebellion that started with Adam and Eve and has gone through all the ages. And again, how, how do you feel sometimes when you... You know, it's interesting about our time. I was just listening to this the other day. Your taxes, and I don't know if this is still going on, but a few years ago... They take our tax money and they give a portion of it to the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, that would go to these artists. And this one artist had this display in New York City, and he had a crucifix in a jar of urine. How does that make you feel? And all I could say is, it's a good thing I'm not a Muslim. You know, you know I say, sometimes you look at the Muslims, and Christians, you know, Christians, they, 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 you know, they, they, they mock you, or... They, they speak despairingly about you or they say something about Jesus. And I really don't care what you say, you know, people say about me. But they, when, they, when they talk in, in a really foul way about the Lord, um, you know, we, we say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going I'm to pray for you that the Lord bless you and change your heart. Man, the Muslims, they, you know, they, man, they, they really got it down. You know, when you, you, say, you say something bad about Allah, you say something bad about Muhammad, they take a contract down and you hunt you down and kill you. I said to my wife one day, I think I'd be a better Muslim than a Christian. This Christian thing is hard. Well, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I ain't converting to Allah, okay? But it's, it, the Christian thing is, is let me tell you, it's, it's, this thing is, you've got to really just drag yourself into the presence of, it's hard. It's hard. One day, though, God is going to crush the entire system. One day God is going to, he's going to, he's going to judge all, he's going to judge this, this, this ugly system, this evil system, this harlot, that again we saw in Revelation 17, this, this false uh, religious system, this, this abomination to God, he is going to crush it and he, he is going to eliminate it. And that's going to be the end of the rebellion. Now, that's the end of the rebellion that we know in this time and dispensation that we live in. There's another rebellion that happens, even after the end of this rebellion, there's still one more, more rebellion coming, and I'll cover that in two weeks, Everybody looks at that second rebellion and says, why? God, what are you doing? And we'll get into that. You'll understand that in two weeks. And then the last thing here is divine sovereignty. They're pra praising him for his sovereignty. His sovereignty means God is in control. Hey, you know what? All these crazy things that are going on in Syria and the crazy things going on in Libya and the crazy things going on in Egypt and the crazy things going on in your backyard and in your house and in your neighborhood... All the crazy stuff that's going on, God is still on the throne and he's still in control. It doesn't mean that, that he causes evil. But in this time we live in, he has permitted it. And he is the Almighty who is in 100% total control of all things. He is, he is, as the Word of God says in verse 6, he is omnipotent and he reigns. I want to show you just a, a beautiful thing. This will bring comfort to some of your hearts. I don't know where I, I got this from, though. I think I got it from Charles Stanley about 20 years ago in one of his sermons, and I jotted it down. It's just deeply meaningful to me. Three, three things here. God is all-loving, and since he is all-loving, he wants what's best for, you, for us. God is all-loving, and since he is all-loving, he wants what's best for you. You know, just think of this. You know, if you have people in your lives that you love, your children, your, you know, your spouse, your, your parents, you always want what's best for them. The problem is we can want what's best, but we don't always know what's best. And the second is, God is all wise, and since he is all wise, he knows what's best for us. He knows exactly what's best for us. A lot of times, I don't know what's best for me. Hey, when I was younger, 
I was a, I was a, a power lifter and a bodybuilder. And my dream was to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, I wanted to be this Arnold Schwarzenegger and be bodybuilding champion of the world and then eventually become the governator. <laughs> be the governator and then eventually I, wa I wanted to become a famous uh, Hollywood actor and be the Terminator. <laughs> and I had a serious injury. And I uh, was doing some crazy exercises with 600 pounds on my back and basically crushed some nerves and experienced a mild paralysis on my left side and basically never got the full strength back. And I prayed to God. I prayed to God during that time. And I became a believer a few, a few short time later. And I prayed to God and I said to the Lord, Lord, heal me and give me the strength of Samson. I want the strength of Samson, Lord. I want to be so, so much stronger than I was before. I want to be like, I want to be a world champion. And I'll give you all the glory. But that wasn't in God's plan. And God had a different plan. And it wasn't to build my body. It was to build the body of Christ. So there's, just, there's time where the Father, our Father knows better. I see, I see people in the church sometimes and, uh, through the years. I've done their weddings where they're going out with somebody or they're, they're in love with somebody and things don't work out. And you know, they'll, they'll call me on the phone and come in for a counseling session and sit there. And they're, they're all upset that things didn't work out. And, and then all of a sudden, you know what? Then the right person comes into their life. The right person, the, God, the, the person that God intended. And all of a sudden, they're, you know, they're all saying, aren't, aren't you glad you didn't marry that other person? Aren't you glad it didn't work? This is what God had for you. God knows. God is, God is all wise. He knows what's best for us. So, so he is all knowing, uh, he is all loving, and since he's all loving, he wants what's best for us. And since God is all wise, it, he knows what's best for us. And the last thing, and again, you, you can... You can want what's best for somebody with a heart of love. You can know what's best for somebody in wisdom. Most of us don't have the power to do what's best for them, but God does. God is all-powerful, and since he is all-powerful, he will do what's best for us. And that, that is, that is a, a picture, again, of the omnipotence of God. And when you come to know God as the omnipotent God, you will find that you will enter into a place of peace. When you come to really understand the omnipotence of God, then you'll enter into a place of joy. But if you do not believe and you cannot trust God with your life as being the, the omnipotent one who reigns, I promise you there's going to be a lot of chaos, there's going to be a lot of misery, and there'll be a lot of unhappiness in your life. I've watched people go through the trials, the trials of a lifetime here in these last years with joy. And I've watched people think of it like, like, they're, fa like they're facing death. The, 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 the trials of a lifetime. And I see people going through just, like, you know, I know some of you, you know, not to make light of your, 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 some of your problems, but seeing people going through problems that are so much less and they're just freaked out. I mean, they disappear for months. They, they, they're not in communion with God. They're angry. They're, they're filled with fear and anxiety. It just tells me they haven't come to know Him. As, as the omnipotent God who reigns. This is why you have this wonderful praise. They are praising God. Again, there's so many thousands of other reasons in the scriptures to praise God. All right, number two. The marriage of the Lamb. Or the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to look here at just answering a few questions. The first is, who is the bridegroom? Who is the bridegroom? Yeah, we know this is, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb. We know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. In fact, let me tell you, this book is a, a book of the Lamb. You want, you, want a, you want a theme that flows right from Genesis through Revelation? It is the book of the Lamb, of the Lamb of God. Right from chapter 3, verse 6, when sin entered the world, what do you have? You have God's preparation of the Lamb. He, he, is, he is the Lamb of God who came to take away uh, the sins of the world. But it is, it is clearly the, the, the book of the Lamb. John chapter 1 verse 29. When John saw, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, look, he, said, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the bridegroom. In his parable in Matthew chapter 22 of the uh, wedding feast, it talks about a father who is going to have a wedding for his son. And he goes out and he invites all these people and they all say, oh, you know what? No, I'm not coming. I gotta, I gotta, you know what it is? I got I a field. I got to go plow my field. Oh, I just got married. I can't come. You ever see people give you excuses about, about not wanting to pursue God? You know what the, the truth of the matter is? Excuses, they are like metal muffins. They all stink. 
Have you ever smelt one that smelt good? I, I never have. I don't know if some of you don't know what a metal muffin is. That's a cow poop. Okay, some of you who haven't been, from, been down on the farm in a while. The New Yorkers are saying, what is that? What's a metal muffin? I don't even know what a metal is. They haven't smelled or seen a metal in years. It's true about excuses. You see, I never, I never, never smelled one that smelled, right, that smelled good. And they've got all these excuses to the Lord. He's throwing a wedding for his son. So you know what he says? He says, he says, he says, you know what he says, damn those people. They're damned. And he says, now go out and go to, go to the people, go to, go to the, the lowly people, go to the people that you never, you know, think would, you know, that, that anybody cares for. Go to the people in the, in the cor dark corners of the earth and invite them. He goes, because I'm throwing a wedding for my son. And it's those who, who came. You know what that's a picture of? In his time, the Jews rejected him. You know what he said? Go to the Gentiles. Because to the Jews, those were the last people in the world, the Gentiles, that, that they expected would ever come to the Lord. And we come into the church age that we're in. It doesn't mean there aren't Jews who believe. There were many Jews who believed in the beginning, and there still are Jews who believe now. But he is the bridegroom. Who's the bride? Well, you know what? There's a lot of debate about that. There's some scholars who say that the bride is Israel. And there's others who say that the bride is the church. And there's some who say the bride is both. And I, I, I'll tell you, just when I look at Israel in the Old Testament, again, God has a plan for Israel, and there are many people who are saved through the different, uh, through the different ages who are part of Israel. But I, I look at Israel, though at times she is called the wife of God. And there are a number of portion, passages where she's called the wife of God. She is also a wife that is called an adulterer for her idolatry. If you want to see it played out, look at the book of Hosea. It's played out in, in completion. You'll find it in Isaiah, you'll find it in Jeremiah, you'll find it in Amos, you'll find it in Malachi. But it's played out in its fullness. Israel becomes a harlot, an adulterating wife. And she is, is, is essentially, there's a rejection that happens there. So I, I don't believe that the, the, the bride is, um, is Israel. I think the Word of God makes it clear who the bride is. And I'm going to read to you from 2 Chronicles 11.2. For I am, Paul says this, for I am jealous for you. And he's talking here to the church, the church of, of the Corinthians. But he's talking to the church. He says, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed, betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I mean, if you look at that passage, who is, the, who is the bride? The bride is the church. And it's the true church. Understand, the church has been imperfect throughout the ages. But the true church, now I'm not talking about the false church. Now there's a lot of you know, people, everybody, uh, you know, what's your religion? I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Of course, the only time you ever hear them mention Jesus is when they're cursing him, when they're, when they're taking his name in vain. I'm, I'm not talking about the false church. I'm talking about the true church. The true believers who have been born of the Spirit of God. People who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has entered into them and He's changed them. And look, if you're a believer, you know when you meet these people. I don't care, I don't care what group they come from, what, what brand or denomination they've come from. When I meet them, I know them. There, there's something about them, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they smell. There's something different about them. And you know, you know when you're meeting a person who, hey, is a pastor. You know what I get all the time? You hear people, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. And all of a sudden they start acting all religious with you. Oh, yeah, 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 I go to this church, I do this, I, you know, you know. Hey, man, if you know Christ, you know Christ, not a bunch of religious nonsense. The true church, the true believers, not the tares, the true wheat is the bride of Christ. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 20, uh, 33. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 33. This is a passage where Paul is exhorting the church in the marriage relationship that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And wives are to submit to their husbands. And you know what the scripture, it begins by saying we are to submit to one another. But here, let me just read this to you, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy, um, she, um, so that she should be holy without blemish. 
So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. Now notice it's a It's a mystery. He's talking about, it's a mystery here, here the man, the husband is to love his wife, and the wife is to love the husband, just as Christ loves the church, and the church loves Christ. Verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you um, in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see and she res- that she respects her husband. The picture here again is the, the bride is the church. The groom is Jesus. Now, in the Jewish wedding, there were three different parts. There there was first the betrothal. And in the betrothal, it was essentially, it was an arrangement. If you remember Mary and Joseph, Mary and Joseph's marriage was arranged when they were little children by their parents and and by a a rabbi. So it's it's the betrothal is is where it begins. When were we betrothed to Christ? I want to to just, I think I put it in your notes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Here is our betrothal to Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world. He chose you. In him before the foundations of the... By the way, this is a hot potato. Pastors don't like touching this one. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. That is our betrothal. to to the Lord, that before the foundations of the world, God chose you. You know what he saw? God knows all things. He knows the beginning from the end. God looks through the ages. And he saw the day that Sammy Medina would open his heart to Jesus Christ, and he chose you. He chose you all the way back then, seeing what you would do now. It doesn't take away personal responsibility. Some people say, well, if God knows everybody who's going to be saved through the ages, then, then why must I bother? Because you still have free will and you still have a choice. And it is your choice that God ultimately sees in which he will then predestine you to be adopted as a child of God. But God knows. God knew the, God knew the day that I would kneel down on, on a cold bathroom floor around the corner from here in an apartment and fold my hands over that sink on a January 15th night, 1983, and ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. God knew that from the very foundations of the earth through all eternity. When I was betrothed, as you were betrothed to him. Nevertheless, you still must make a choice. The second is the presentation. The presentation is when the wife is presented to her husband. You know what the presentation is like? You're here doing a wedding. I stand here. And you have, the, you have the, the groom and the best man, and then sometimes you have the wedding party there, and then the doors open, and you have the bridesmaids come down, you've got the flower girl, she comes down, she does her thing, you've got the ring bearer, he comes down, they come over here and they line up here, and then the doors close. And then the, the piano player, the organ player, they begin to play, dun, dun, da, 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 and the doors open. And you know what, you have, you have this guy standing here, and all of a sudden she's being presented. And, and here's this beautiful bride. And you know what happens? I can, I can see his legs knocking together. <laughs> Seen this a thousand times. He's like... And his, I, could, I could hear the heartbeat. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. And you know what you usually get? It's just, you get, I get this. You get, wow. Wow, man. Like she's, like she's never looked better. It's like, wow. She's beautiful. Presentation. That's, a, that, that's the presentation of the... When will we be presented, when, or when will we be presented to the groom? I want you to think about this. 
So if, if, if the, the actual betrothal occurred in the foundations of the world, when are we presented to him? Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know what the Lord's talking about there? The Lord, the Lord after he ascended to heaven, he's gone to prepare a place for us. And, and just want you to think of this. Hey, if God could create the earth in seven days, he's been up there for 2,000 years. Man, what, what he's got going on up there is, is going to look way beyond what we have down here. But he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to come back. And, and I'm going to take you with me. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That, that is when we are presented to the Lord. At the rap, suddenly, in a twinkling of an eye, it says that an entire generation of believers are going to be taken out of this earth and they're going to meet the Lord in the clouds. That's the presentation. And then you have the ceremony, Revelation 19. When does the ceremony happen? Right, right here. At the, at the end of the tribulation. We, we come to the ceremony, to the feast. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. Number three. When does the wedding take place? Right at the end of the tribulation. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time at this. We're right at the end. of. Remember, the tribulation is a seven-year period. The Bible, it calls it, in, in, in the Old Testament, it's called Jacob's trouble. In Daniel, it, it's called Daniel's final week of seven years. And it is, it is a time of trial. It's everything that you have in Revelation chapter 6 through 19 that we've been in for these last months. At the end of the tribulation period, the church, the church has been taken out of the world. The church is with the Lord. And then we have the wedding. We have this wonderful wedding ceremony. We are the groom. Well, I'm sorry, he is the groom. We are the bride. Now, fourth thing here. How does the bride make herself ready? Look at, look at verse 8. 19 verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There, there are two things that happen when we give our hearts to Christ. One, just by simply putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God imputes to you His righteousness. And it's called imputed righteousness. It's a key thing to understand. That just simply by putting your faith in Christ... Listen, as an unbeliever when I understood this, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. Remember the Godfather, the offer he couldn't refuse? Let me tell you, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. I said, this is the best offer, this is the best thing I ever heard, that I could have all my sins forgiven and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb and be made, be made to stand before God as though I've never sinned. That is the imputed righteousness of God. But there's another aspect to the righteousness of God, and it's called imparted righteousness. That not only did He totally forgive you in a forensic manner, but He, he came in to your heart and He changed your heart. And He gave you a heart now to obey Him. He gave you His Spirit to begin to live very differently. To begin to produce fruit in your life. Well, well, we, as we obey God, as we do the things God has called us to do, as we work for God in this world, and again, we're not working for salvation. You know, two of great, the greatest lies of Satan, to the unbeliever, you have to work to be saved. And you'll find that that's religion. That's in every Hinduism, Buddhism, the false Christian church, you have to work to be saved. Folks, you can never work to be saved. Salvation is a free gift. It's an insult to God to think that you somehow can earn salvation. If, if that was the case, then why would Jesus Christ have to leave His throne in heaven, come down to earth, and get splattered up onto that cross if you can somehow attain salvation through your own works? So Satan comes and says, oh, you know what? You can work to be saved. That's the first thing. You know what the second lie is? To believers who have been saved by grace, you know what he says to them? He says to us, you know what? You're saved by grace. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to work. You just kind of, you just kind of coast through life. You know, go on sinning so that grace may abound. He, he's forgiven you. He's, and, and, Paul, and Paul says that in Romans. Go on sinning. He says, does God say that we should go on sinning that grace should, should abound? He says, God forbid. As believers now who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, 
Our hearts should be filled with a love to serve God and, and to be fruitful in the way we live and produce, produce wonderful works. Look at what, uh, what the Word of God, in Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. Notice this, he says, he says, we should be affirming this constantly to one another, that those who have believed in God should be uh, careful, be careful! We should be affirming to one another to be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Hey, Matthew chapter 6, 19-20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. The way you're living now, listen to this. You're storing up treasures for yourself in heaven. Oh, I thought you just said that we were saved by grace. Absolutely we're saved by grace. But don't, don't underestimate what the scripture says that you, the things you're doing in this life now, are going to be carried with you into the next life. That, that if you're storing up treasures by the way you are behaving right now as a believer. We're going to be judged according to what we did. Not a judgment of condemnation. I believe it's a reward ceremony called the Bema Seat of Christ. You know, you've, heard, you've heard this story. A woman dies, she goes up to heaven. And uh, she meets Peter at the pearly gates. She's saved by grace. She accepted Jesus Christ. She was washed by the blood of the Lamb. She had faith in Jesus as her Lord and Savior. But she just never did anything for the Lord. You meet people like that. We see people in the church like that. So um, she says, oh, where's my uh, mansion? Jesus said that, that he was going to build me a mansion. And Peter said, come on, I'll, I'll show you. So they, they're walking down the streets of gold. And they see this big mansion. And she says, is that my mansion? He goes, no, that's Moses. They walk down a little further. Is that my mansion? No, that's Paul's. A little further. Is that my mansion? No, that's Peter's. A little further. Is that my mansion? No, that's Malachi's. A little further. Is, is, is that my mansion? No, 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 that was Timothy's. He brings it all the way down to the end of the street. And there's this little shack there. You know, a shack. Like a one-room shack with an outhouse. I don't know if we're going to use outhouses in heaven. There's an outhouse. And it's a shack. There's not even any, any glass on the windows. There, there's no gold, there's no precious stones, it's just a shack. And he goes, there's your mansion. And she looks at him and says, that's all? And Peter looked at her and said, that's all we could do with what you sent us. <laughs> and that's true. That's true. That we are to be fruitful and, and we are to be about the work of the Lord. Uh, Peter, he says that all things are going to be tested by fire. Think about your life. If, if everything you have done in your life is tested by fire, what goes on and lasts? It's the only the eternal things that last. You can, man, you can, you can make tons of money and you can have a really big house and you can have all these successes in your life and it's all going to get burned up. What did you do for God? And we will stand before the bema seat of Christ and we're going to give an accounting. And again, it's not a condemnation, it's a judgment. It talks about that in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 5 verse 10. But we will give an accounting to God. All right, number five. Who are the guests? Who are the guests? Take a guess at who are the guests. You know who I believe the guests are? People say they're the angels. Mm, I, I, don't, I think this is about redemption. I think that the guests, or the angels may be looking in. I think the guests are the Old Testament saints. And listen to what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist was called the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He's in the Old Testament covenant. And John in chapter 3 verse 29 said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands, and he's the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. You know what John is saying? I'm the friend of the bridegroom. He's not saying that he's the bride. I believe all the Old Testament saints. There's going to be, Moses is going to be there as a guest. And Jeremiah is going to be there as a guest. And Isaiah is going to be there as a guest. And Elijah is going to be there as a guest. And Miriam's going to be there as a guest. Esther's going to be there as a guest. And we're going to be the bride. And he's going to be the groom. And then there's going to be what every wedding right has, a honeymoon. I'm just going to ask you this. When and where is the honeymoon? Well, you're going to learn about that in two weeks. Because there is, there's a 1,000 year honeymoon. Imagine that, some of you got a week, maybe you're lucky you got two weeks, maybe you're really lucky you got three weeks. How about a 1,000 year honeymoon with the Lord? 
And that's cool. Hey, I want to wrap it up. I want you to look at, uh, at two things. Verse 9, we have uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, in verse 17, there's another supper. It, it is called the Supper of the Great God. Two suppers in Revelation 19. And we have a choice here. We have many choices in life. You, you have a choice as to which supper you're going to be part of. You can join him for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Man, that's the supper I want to be at. Or the birds can have you for supper in Revelation chapter 19, 17 through 18. I'll talk about this next week. One's a supper for believers, the other's a supper for unbelievers. The marriage supper of the Lamb is dining with the Lord. You know what? And it's going to be cool because, you know, when you go to a wedding, you like you sit there and you look at the bride and groom, we're going to be up there at the head table with Him. We're going to be at the head table with Him. But the marriage supper of the Lamb is dining with the Lord, the supper of the great God. I mean, it's really what it, it, it's saying there. The birds are feeding on you. That's not too cool. The marriage supper of the Lamb is for believers. The supper of the great God is a, a supper for unbelievers. The marriage supper, marriage supper, of, the, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb is, is a supper of grace. The marriage supper, uh, the great supper of, uh, of God is a, uh, it's a supper of wrath. Marriage supper of the Lamb is a supper of life. Marriage supper of, or, or the supper of the great God is a supper of death. Marriage supper of the Lamb is a supper of, in heaven. And the supper of the great God is a supper that ultimately ends up in hell. Marriage supper of the Lamb is a supper of joy, and the supper of the great God is a supper of misery. Marriage supper of the Lamb is about everlasting life, and the great supper of God is about everlasting destruction. We have a choice. See, God, God's giving us an invitation. I, just want to, I want you to think of this. God's giving us an invitation to accept, and people will say, well, God's giving us an invitation to accept the wedding. No, that's, that's not what he's giving you. God is giving you an invitation of marriage. God is giving you a wedding proposal. Understand that. Jesus is calling you into a marriage relationship with Him. To, to, to accept the invitation, okay, is to accept a, a marriage proposal. You know what? It's, 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 this is what it's saying. I, Frank, take you, Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for all eternity. And Jesus saying to us, I, Jesus, take you, Sammy, or, or Tony, or Fran, or Sue, or B. I, Jesus, take you to be my bride, my child, my son, my daughter, to have and to hold from this day forward in better or for worse, in sickness and in health for all eternity. And the person who accepts this, this wedding proposal, they enter into a relationship, into a fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. It is, it is an invitation of, of, of intimacy. It is an invitation of relationship. It is an invitation, yes, He will forgive you of all your sins, but He will come in and have a life with you. That is the, the invitation of Christ. It's not a religion, some religious nonsense, some religious gymnastics, a religious you know, belonging to a church or a denomination. It's coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're having a hard time believing that, then read the Gospels for yourself. Read His words for yourself because that is what He has invited us to. And it culminates. It culminates. And really, I'll say this, it culminates, but then the culmination is a totally new beginning in the wedding supper of the Lamb. Bow your heads and let's close up in prayer.